Revelation chapter 1, when we first started, I talked about um, the different ways that Revelation has been interpreted, okay? There's been different views, different ways to interpret Revelation, and that, that's why some churches don't even want to teach Revelation. They really don't even want to go through it because they say, oh, you know, it's divisive. It causes division, and, and you know, because, you know, we really can't figure it out all anyway in, in, until it happens, so we just should kind of stare away from it. Well, the book of Revelation tells us that you're blessed if you study and read the prophecy of this book. The book of Revelation was written, as we'll see in this chapter, to seven churches, to seven pastors that came to retrieve this book and had to preach it and teach it to their congregation. So that's why we do what we do. Now, the different ways to interpret Revelation, and I won't get too deep into them, one is the, is the preterist view. The preterist view says that all the Revelation already happened in the first century, there's nothing left to happen. It already happened in the destruction of the temple. And, you know, Jesus talked about that a little bit on, on his way to the cross, that all these things are going to be fulfilled and weep for you, don't weep for me, weep for your children. And he's talking to that generation back then only. So it all already happened. And that's the preterist view. Then there's a partial preterist view. Okay, the partial preterist view says about 90% of Revelation was fulfilled in the first century, but the rest will be fulfilled on the last day when Jesus comes back. And there's a few other interpretations, but one is the, another one is the, the idealist theory or the historical spiritual theory that Revelation is just kind of telling us a, a story of, of history, the history of good and evil. And you really can't draw conclusions from it that, you know, that there's going to be actually seven bowl judgments and trumpet judgments and vile judgments. That's not really going to happen. It's just telling us a picture of the way God judges evil and God hates evil and the continual battle between evil and good. And then the other interpretation, which is the interpretation I hold to, which I believe is accurate. If you want to be wrong, you can hold to those other ones. Um, <laughs> Not that I'm you know, a scholar or a son of a scholar, but I, I do study from some, um, is the futurist interpretation. That most of, if not all of, at least chapter four on of the book of Revelation has not happened yet. And I believe that's the clearest interpretation because remember I talked about this a few weeks ago. We can look back at the Old Testament and all churches, no matter what denomination you are, agree that Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies concerning his first coming. But there are prophecies concerning his second coming. And that's why the church is uh, divided over Revelation. Well, has this happened yet? We're not sure yet. Well, it happened in the first century. You know, it's just a picture of good and evil and all this stuff. Well, I believe once it happens, we'll, we as a church will be able to look back and say, oh, it's all done. It happened. So it still has to be future because we can't do that yet. Most of Revelation has not taken place because if it did, we'd all be able to look back clearly and say, yes, this all did get fulfilled just like it did at Jesus' first coming. And there's a key verse to that method of interpretation, and we should get into it today. All right. But as we left off last week, we talked about John's introduction, and he gives us a blessing if we read this prophecy. He tells us in the introduction, in, in verse 1, we, won't, we don't have to read it, that God, Jesus, gave him this prophecy and signified it. He gave him signals and signs to teach us something about what was going on in John's day all the way to the future when Jesus comes again. And he said, we're blessed if we study those things. And then we left off in verse 4. We got through a little bit of it. Now, what you're going to see here in verses 4 through the end of this chapter, you're going to see an introduction to the character of Jesus Christ, Okay? You say, Pastor Matt, when's the end time stuff coming and the, the this and the that and the bombs going off and everything else and the rapture? Well, we'll get to that. That's in chapter 4. All right, that's in chapter 4 to the end of the chapter. But we have to set the foundation, obviously, before we move there. You, what you're going to see here in, in this part of Revelation is you're going to see an introduction to the character of Jesus Christ. What is Jesus Christ like? Who is this Jesus Christ? Remember, Revelation means to unveil, to uncover. Jesus in his first coming came in humility, okay? In his second coming, we know he comes in glory. And, and chapter one tells us, well, what is Jesus doing right now? We see his character, we see his, pre his past ministry we're gonna see, and then we're gonna see his present ministry. What is he doing right now in the midst of the churches, in the midst of people's lives? So we're gonna see his character, 
his past ministry and his first coming, and then we're going to see his present ministry, what he's doing right now in the churches, and then from Revelation 4 on, we see the future ministry of Jesus Christ when he comes in judgment. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches, let me get my timer here, John, to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So John is saying, grace and peace to these churches. Now as you read Revelation 2 and 3, you're going to get a detailed sketch of what's going on in these churches. And a lot of them were off base. But they were still churches. But it's God's heart and it's God's mind and it's God's prerogative to give grace and peace all the time. A church shouldn't be a place of condemnation. It should be a place of conviction, right? People should get convicted. You shouldn't just go out of church. If, if, the, if the minister and the people are doing their job in church, and when we come together, you shouldn't go out every single, every single service saying, hey, hip, hip, hooray. Sometimes you should, but sometimes you should go, oh, man, that was convicting. I got to get my life tied up in this area. I, uh, I got to do a better job as a husband, father, wife, mother, or whatever it is. That's what you should get, because that's what you get as you read the word of God. That's what God does to me. That's what he does to us. But it's always God's prerogative, God's way to give us grace and peace in the midst of that. Now watch. He says, grace and peace be unto you from him which is, which was, which is to come, that's Christ, and from the seven spirits, the sevenfold work of the Holy Spirit, we can do, you can do six sermons on that altogether, but we won't do that, which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, now this is his character and his past, now watch what he did for us in the past, then we're going to move into from verse 9 on what he's doing for us now, faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So who is this Jesus? What is he doing? What did he do for us? Well, first of all, it says he is the faithful witnesses, the, the faithful witness, all right? Because the Bible says, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says about the last days. It says, many false prophets and false witnesses have gone out into the world. It already happened and started in the first century. John tells us that in 1 John. Many false Christs, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. But Jesus is the faithful witness. Remember? Stood before Pilate. Well, what is truth? You tell me what truth is. Well, and he says, hereafter you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great glory and power. What is truth? Jesus is that faithful witness. He is the faithful witness. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that God in the past spoke to his servants by the prophets, but in these last days, the last days are from the time of Christ until the end, has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. What Jesus says is truth. He is the faithful witness. And so listen, the opposite is also true. That anything else and any other religious guru or any other religion that's not grounded on the word of God, the words of Jesus Christ, is a false witness and a fake witness. That's what it says. Listen, people get, they get angry at me and they get angry at God in the Bible because they say, well, that's not right. That's narrow. Who is God to do that? You know, all roads lead to God and it just, it, it, you know, it's all going to work out in the end. Everybody's just going to reach God. Well, the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That no man can come to God the Father. No man can go to heaven except through him because he is the faithful witness He's faithful. When he speaks his word, he stands by his word. His word will be fulfilled. Exactly the way he says. Now, what else is he? It says, and he is the first begotten of the dead. Now, that doesn't mean he's the first person to ever rise from the dead. There were resurrections in the Old Testament. Jesus raised people from the dead during his earthly ministry. But when it says he's the first begotten of the dead, it means he's first place among all those who have come out of the graves, and who are coming out of the graves. Now listen, Jesus says, 
The, the time is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and some will be raised to everlasting condemnation, some will be raised to everlasting glory and everlasting life. But amongst all that will be raised from the dead, and by the way, every single person ever born will be raised from the dead. Jesus says some to condemnation, those who didn't believe that he was the faithful witness, and some to everlasting life. Everybody's going to come out. But among everybody that's coming out from the grace, he is first place among them. He's number one in his humanity and in his glory. Now watch what it says. And it says he's the prince of the kings of the earth. Prince of the kings of the earth. You know what that means? That means he's in control. He's in control of all the governments, of all the nations, of all the kings, of all the presidents, of all the prime ministers, of all the statesmen. He's number one. Now, we look around through our nation, and we look around through the world, and we might not think that. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible said God, says God raises up one, one man, and sometimes he raises up one nation, and he puts down another. You see, when people read the Old Testament, they'll read the Old Testament, and they'll read about the way God used the, you know, the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians you know, to come in and judge his people and the Philistines and all that. And he said, well, they go, God doesn't do that anymore, though. He doesn't do that anymore. Now's the age of grace, and we just preach the gospel, and God's only concerned about the church and the gospel. Wait a minute. Did God get off the throne? No, he did not. As far as I know, there's still nations coming to power, and there's nations being put down. God's still doing the same thing. Now, the gospel should permeate through all of that, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the prince. He's the king. He's the one that's sovereign and in control of everything that goes on. Listen, some people think I'm an extremist, but I really believe that there's not one molecule anywhere in the universe that's rogue, that's doing what it wants to do. I believe he's in control of it. He's the king. He's the, he's the prince in the, of all the kings of the earth. And look what he did for us. It says, unto him... That loved us. Now, this is his past ministry. Yes, does he not still love us? Of course he does. But it says, he that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's the prince. He's the king of all the kings of the earth. But he's also our savior. He's also the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world came to this earth to die to wash us from our sins in his own blood. He died for us. Now, this is what he's done for us. Now, look what he does. Verse 6. He has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus didn't come to make us just slaves, though we are servants. Though we should have the attitude of a slave. Master, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to give up, I'll give it up. Whenever and wherever and however. Because you're God, you're the king, you're my savior. You love me this much. How can I not do that for you? Remember Paul said, he said, the love of Christ constrains me. Constrains him to keep going on in ministry. To keep fighting the good fight of faith. Right? Right? Because he loved us and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he did that to make us kings and priests. How much do you mean to God? How much do I mean to God? Now think about it. We go about our everyday lives. We go about our everyday lives, you know what? And how many times throughout the day does God come to our mind in obeying God and living for God? Some more than others, I guess, but I don't know. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to go throughout your day when you're at work, driving your car, and do whatever you do, and it's just going to be God all the time. You're just going to have the name of God and Jesus. And that. No, but constantly there should be things coming up about his word, about his grace, about his love, about what he's done, and, and conviction from the Holy Spirit so we can live more for him and do more for him and be used of him. To a greater degree. Look what it says. It says, he made us kings. He made us priests. That means we're going to rule and reign with him. Unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. 
Behold, he comes with clouds. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. John says, even so, come, Lord Jesus, do it, amen. Let everybody see you. Listen, this is why I believe that Revelation is still future, or at least from chapter 4 on, because every eye hasn't seen him come, okay? Remember when he was taken up into heaven in Acts chapter 1? talks about this. He, he, he gives another commission to the disciples, right? It says he, then he, he went up from them in the clouds, and then the angels are standing there saying, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, whom you've seen go out, is going to come again in like manner, the same way. He went up in the clouds into glory in his ascension, and he's coming back. Now, when he comes back again, it says, every eye shall see him. Now, listen, I don't know how that's going to happen. Because I know Jesus comes back as a man, right? He's the son of man. He comes back as a man, just like he came the first time in humility as a man. He's coming back as a man. How's every eye going to see him? I don't know. I, I don't know if God just lets heaven meet earth at that time and the heavens get opened up and, and we get to see all the glory of God and as he's coming back. Or maybe we live in that day when he comes when every eye can't see him on their cell phone. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I know in the first century, every eye didn't see him come back. So with the preterist, remember I talked about the preterist interpretation and the partial preterist interpretation, which says all of Revelation was fulfilled in the first century. What they say is uh, this is apocalyptic literature, they say. Because God, when he often came in judgment in the Old Testament, came in the clouds of judgment. So it must be apocalyptic literature. Well, still, even if it is, not every eye saw him. Okay? He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Listen, sometimes living for Jesus, hear me, sometimes living for Jesus, we feel like, you know what, Lord, I hate being the minority. I hate it. I hate being surrounded by a, a, a midst of people that don't think about you, that don't care. And there's so many of them, they start to rub off on me instead of me rubbing off on them, you know? <coughs> being mocked and persecuted and everything else to, to different degrees, all of us. But Jesus Christ, he's the one in control. He is, was, and he is to come. He's the almighty. So you know what that means? God and you make a majority. All right? Just God makes a majority. He's in control. He's the one that holds everything together. He's the one with you that's the majority. So it doesn't matter what everybody else says or what everybody else does. If you're in Jesus Christ, in the end, you come through. In the end, you win. He's the Almighty. I, John who am also your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. Remember, the small rock, basically, in the midst of the, uh, of the Mediterranean. In the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So why did they exile him there? Because he was a preacher of the word, because he lived the word. And they put him there. It was a prison colony. They basically exiled you know, prisoners to this rock to just live out their lives. Now, remember, the, the history of John goes like this. They went to boil him in oil, all right, to kill him. And basically, like, a, a sweet aroma went up, and he just didn't die. So the emperor was in such rage, they said, you know what? Exile him. Get rid of him. So God performed some kind of a miracle. That's what church history tells us. So he's there on this island of Patmos, and he's getting this revelation of Jesus Christ. Now listen, we're going to see Jesus in his present work. What is Jesus doing right now? We saw Jesus in his past work. He loved us. He died for us. Okay? What's he doing right now? What's he doing in his present ministry? We talk about, oh, when Jesus comes again. Oh, when Jesus comes again. Yes, that's when he's coming. That's in the future ministry. But what's he doing right now in his present ministry? In your life and in the midst of the churches, he's going to tell us. He says, I was in the spirit, verse 10, on the Lord's day, it was a Sunday. 
and, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, when he says in the spirit, it doesn't mean that he was doing weird things like I talked about Wednesday night and flipping out and rolling around on the ground and all that stuff. He wasn't doing that in the spirit. When he says in the spirit, it, says he was, it means he was translated. He was brought to another dimension. He was worshiping God in, in spirit on the Lord's day, and he was brought to another dimension. He's going to get the first vision in Revelation right here. The first vision, the first vision is what Jesus is doing now, what he looks like in the midst of all the churches, okay? He goes, I'm in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, when you hear a trumpet, what does a trumpet call? It means pay attention. Get up, get ready, get marching. So he hears this voice, and it sounds like a trumpet, basically telling him, John, pay attention here. What I'm about to show you and what I'm about to tell you is of extreme importance. Remember, revelation means unveiling, uncovering. He's going to get an unveiling of Jesus in his present ministry to the churches. He see, now, this is what the voice sounded like. It sounded like a trumpet. Pay attention, John, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what you see right in a book. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now, those are, were all seven literal towns and seven literal churches in those towns in the province of Asia Minor, which today, as we know, is modern-day Turkey. So Jesus tells him, pay attention, John. I'm going to give you something to write down, and I want you to get it to these churches, okay? Church history tells us that there were some of these pastors that sent people to the island of Patmos from these churches to get these letters from John, and vice versa. John sent them out. Verse 12 says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. In being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, there's no mystery here, or lampstands, some interpretations say. Verse 20 tells us what those lampstands or candlesticks are. They're churches. He saw seven churches. He says, as I looked, I turned around, and I, I wanted to hear this voice that spoke with me. We know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He already said, I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last, okay? I was dead. I'm alive. I'm him. And then he looks and he turns and he looks and he sees and he gets this vision in the heavenlies. And what he sees here is this. He sees what? Someone that spoke with him and he saw seven golden lampstands or candlesticks, the King James says. Now, literally, what did it look like? There was some kind of a footing, okay? And there was some kind of a golden pole that came out of this footing and it was burning like a lamp on the top. And he says, in verse 20, it tells you, you don't have to look there, but it basically says, the seven lampstands or candlesticks are the seven churches. You know what that tells me? That tells me that the glory of Jesus Christ and the way he reaches the world shines through the churches. Okay? That's how the glory and the revelation of Jesus Christ gets out to the world. It's through you and through me, through the churches. Now listen, that's why you can't be a Christian that says, I don't belong to any church. I'm my own church. I'm my own thing. Well, you're part of the church mystically. I get that. If you really love Jesus, you're part of his church. But read Revelation. He's writing to seven angels, which are the messengers, the pastors, of seven churches, literal churches in a location, in a place, okay? And he says, these are my lampstands. And I'm, in the one, and I'm the one that's in control of these lampstands. I know what's going on in these lampstands, these churches. That's how Christ shines to the world, is through the churches. So he sees Christ, and he sees in, in, in the midst of Christ seven lampstands with footings, with the pole, with the, with the light shining. And they represent the seven churches. Verse 20 tells them, look what he says, verse 13. And in the midst... Of the seven candlesticks on lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man. He says, 
I saw in the midst of these lampstands. Now, how did he see this? I don't understand the vision. Remember, he's getting a vision in another dimension. Stay with me here. Now, my mind sees a pole with a shining lamp on it. Probably not a light bulb, right? But to, to John, it's a lampstand. It's probably, you know, at, at the, you ever see the way they did lamps back then? There would be these torch type things that are going off. Now, what he sees in the midst of the lampstands, he sees a man. One like unto the Son of Man. One like unto Jesus Christ. Which tells us that Jesus walks in the midst of the churches. That Jesus is alive and well in the midst of the churches. Now what's comforting to me as you read through Revelation, especially 2 and 3, which talk about the seven churches of Asia, these churches, a lot of them, at least five out of seven, were way off base. But he still walked in the midst of them. He was still involved in them. He still knew what was going on in them. Okay? Now listen, as he walks in the midst of the churches, what is he doing there? What is Jesus doing in the midst of the churches? What's he doing in the midst? He's getting this vision. He's on the Lord's day. He gets a vision. He's in the spirit, right? And in the spirit, he looks. He turns around to hear the voice. The voice is God in Christ. And he turns around and he sees these seven lampstands, which are the seven churches, verse 20 tells us. And then he sees Jesus, the Son of Man. What does the Son of Man mean? That was a title for Jesus Christ, right? Which meant that the Messiah, Christ, was a man. He became a man. When you read Luke's gospel, you see the humanity of Christ. So this man walks through the midst of the churches, verse 13, and what is he doing? And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, verse 13, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with the garment, down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Now what is that? What is this garb he's describing? Some translations say a golden sash. If you do a little study of the Old Testament, you see, the garb of the priesthood was like this. They wore these robes, they wore these girdles, and they wore a sash, okay? So what is Jesus doing in the midst of the churches as he walks through the midst of the churches? He's performing the office of a priest, okay? Now, he's always performing the office of a king to the whole world, whether people realize it or not. But in the midst of the churches, and only to the churches, does he perform the office of a priest. Now, what does that mean? Remember in the Old Testament, how were you forgiven? What did you have to do? You had to have faith that you brought a sacrifice, you brought it to a priest, the priest slaughtered it for you, right? And then he offered that sacrifice to God on behalf of your sin. And that priest was your go-between, that priest was the one that you had to go to to be forgiven of sins, okay? What is Jesus doing in the midst of the churches? He's constantly performing the office of a priest for you and for me. That's why, listen, you don't need to go to some earthly man to be forgiven. We have altar call at the end of some services here, and we say, do you want us to pray with you? And then I'll say, you don't have to come and pray with me. We're only going to pray with you to encourage you and bear a burden with you. But you can pray right where you are. You can go to God directly. You can ask for forgiveness directly. You know why? Because Jesus is in the midst of Calvary Chapel, North Shore, performing the office of a priest. Go into the Father for you. Performing the office of a, pe uh, of, of a priest. That's why you can go directly to God. That's why it's not my job as a pastor to sit here and say, hey, you want to be forgiven of your sin? Go out of here and say, you know, a couple of our fathers and a couple of these, you know, walk on, on your knees for, for, for three miles on broken glass, all right? <laughs> then you'll be forgiven. Absolutely not. It's my job to direct you to the great high priest, Jesus Christ, because he always walks in the midst of the churches doing the work of a priest cleansing you of sin if you ask him for it, if you go to him for it. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So he sees this vision of the candlesticks, which are the churches. He sees the Son of Man, Christ, in the midst of the churches, walking through the churches, and he looks like a priest. 
That's the garb he has on. Verse 14 says, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His hair, white like wool. The Bible talks about hair that's white. It says it's wisdom. People that have been around a little while, their hair usually gets grayer and then whiter and everything else, which means they've been around. They know a little bit more than you do, and we tell kids sometimes, you know, respect your elders, those who are older than you, because they know a little bit more than you. Whether you think you know it all, you don't, okay? But the ultimate one who has ultimate wisdom is God, is Jesus. And you know what? The Bible says he's Alpha and Omega. The Bible says he was and he is and he is to come. He's been around a long time, okay? He's been around forever. He's the ancient of days. So if there's anybody who has wisdom, if there's anybody who knows how to apply it, it's him. So this one who walks in the midst of the churches is performing the office of a priest, forgiving your sin every time you go to him and ask for it. And know what he wants to do? He wants to give you counsel. Because he's wise. Now listen, I say this all the time. All you got to do is follow me around for a little while and you say, what is this guy doing? He has no clue what he's doing. The other pastor is the same thing. What are we doing? We get together and we try to figure out and we set direction and we start working it. But then we get together and we say, "What what are we doing here? And we're like, we need wisdom. We need help. We need wisdom. We need guidance. And we have to constantly direct ourselves back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you know what the Bible says? The Bible doesn't say the pastors are the head of the church. The Bible says that Christ is the head and we're all the body. And he's the one who has wisdom. He's the one that we have to go through. You say, well, Pastor Matt, we have the word of God. Isn't that the wisdom of God? Of course it is. But how to apply that sometimes? and what direction to take in the word of God, that's why you have to go to Jesus Christ. So what's Jesus doing in the midst of the churches? As he's walking in the midst of the churches, what is he doing? He's interceding for you as a priest to forgive your sins. He's waiting for you to go to him to give him wisdom. Look, look, look what else it says, to, so he can give you wisdom. It says, as white as snow as here was, in his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So you have his eyes, his feet, and his voice. His eyes, they're like fire. They blaze. You know what fire does? It consumes, right? It consumes. And it says his feet were burning like brass. And the imagery here is, you ever, you ever heat up metal? And, it, and, you know, and you heat up metal, you heat it up so, you know, so much, bronze, metal, any kind of metal, and it starts to glow like white almost, okay? That's the imagery that we're getting here. As this priest, right, was walking in the midst of the churches, forgiving sin, okay? As he's walking in the midst of the churches, wanting to give counsel, wanting to guide you and direct you because he washed you from your sins and and, and he loves you, right? His eyes are like fire burning and his feet are glowing. What's he doing? You know what he's doing? He's gazing through your soul and through the souls in the churches. And what's he looking for? He's trying to purge you of sin. That's what he's doing. He's trying to make you more like himself because he sees, listen, you can't hide from Jesus Christ. He knows everything about you. Listen, you can say that you've told maybe your wife or somebody close to you everything about you, but I'll guarantee you there's a few things you haven't told them. Okay? My wife knows everything about me, but there's still a couple things in there I just don't want her to know. All right? But he knows. He made me. He died for me. He loves me. He makes intercession for me to forgive me. He knows. Right? And his eyes pierce and they see right through it like fire. And what does he do? He doesn't just sit there and look at your sin and gaze at your sin so you can just feel condemned. His feet move. 
brass to judge that sin. So you'll do something about it. He moves to you as he sees that sin and he wants to cleanse you of it. He wants to make you more like himself. All right? And then it says his voice, listen, his voice was like the sound of many waters. Now, this could probably be John's in the island of Patmos, right? And it wasn't, you know, sandy beaches by any means and relaxing water. It was an island where waves crashed and there was power there, okay? And he's saying when Christ speaks, he's speaking now in a command, wanting to do more of a work in our lives. As he gazes and he sees our sin, he wants to gaze at it, but then he wants to go to it with his feet and he wants to cleanse you of it and perform the office of a high priest on your behalf to cleanse you of all sin. That's what he's doing in the midst of the churches. And when he speaks to it, he speaks a command. He speaks with might and he speaks with power. Now watch what he says here. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. Now, what are the seven stars? Again, Revelation 20 tells us. They're messengers. They're probably the pastors, okay? And he says he has them in his hand, in his right hand. The right hand is the right hand of power. When it says Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God, that doesn't mean that, oh, you know, the Father's up here and Jesus is like less over here. No, it means he sits at the power of God, the right hand of God. But Jesus has in his right hand the leaders of those churches. Who's the one who has power? Who's the one that has control? Jesus Christ. And he has them in his hand, right? And what is he doing? Look what he says here. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So what is he doing? What is the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth? It's the word of God. Revelation 19 tells us that. What a pastor is supposed to be preaching that he holds in his right hand? The word of God. They're supposed to teach the word of God. But you know what? <laughs> what does a sword do? It cuts, it fillets, it slices, and it dices, right? It hurts. Well, it says Jesus is doing this. That's why I said when I first started this message, you shouldn't just come in the church and just feel good all the time. Sometimes you should. God's gonna, as God restores and he does work in your life, sometimes you're going to go, you're going to feel cut, you're going to feel filleted, you're gonna, that's what you're going to do. And Jesus, listen, Jesus says to the church of Pergamos, you don't have time, we don't have time to turn there. He basically says, I'm going to make war with you with the sword. Why does he say that? To one of his churches. Because they wouldn't repent of sin and he's going to cut it out. There's a slicing and a dicing that takes place. People ask, well, how come there's so many denominations? How, many there's so, how come there's so many denominations out there? Christ isn't divided, yada, 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 yada. So all the spiritual people say, you know what? I'm part of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm not part of any denomination or this and that and everything else. Well, wait a minute. Do you know why there's so many denominations? It's a, it's a necessary evil, just so you know. Because you, you see what happens in church history. Churches start to go awry doctrinally. They start to go awry. They fade away from the love of Jesus Christ like the church of Ephesus. And they tolerate sin. They don't do anything about it. But Jesus still moves with a sword to make war to cut. And sometimes he'll cut something out and he'll cut something off. He'll cut his believing remnant out and he'll start another movement. And then he'll cut, he'll slice and he'll dice and he'll start another movement. And sometimes churches die off because they've been cut off from Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church of Jesus Christ will prevail until Jesus comes. Because he's the one holding the churches in his hands. He's the one holding the pastors in his hands. He's the one that's in control. It's nine o'clock. A couple more verses and we'll close. And his countenance was as the, sh as the sun shining in its strength. So there was a glow, a glory about Christ. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. He says, I fell at his feet as dead. He was afraid. He was scared. I fell there as dead. Listen, Spurgeon said this, When never more alive, then we're dead at his feet. Then when we're dead at his feet. 
You know what that means? You want to be alive in Jesus Christ? You want Jesus to do more work in your life? Fall at his feet. Deny yourself. Die to yourself. And then he'll live. He says, I fell at his feet as dead. Say, Lord, it's not about me anymore. I'm dead to myself. I want you to live in me. And then look what he says. He says, he touched me and he said, fear not. See, that's what Jesus says. When he does a work in our lives, when he forgives of, of sin, when he cleanses of sin, when his eyes see that sin in our lives and his feet move to it to do a work in our lives, to cleanse us of it, we're horrified sometimes. Lord, I don't want to give that sin up. I'm afraid. I, I, I want to hold on to it. Well, Jesus died for you to make you like him, to give you eternal life. And then he moves to you, and then when you come to that place of humility, he's touched. He says, fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. God wants to do that work in your life. And then it says this, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and of death. Listen, the devil doesn't have the keys of hell and of death, okay? God's in control of who's going to heaven, who's going to hell, okay? The devil's not going around hell like a king, you know, pitching people in, in the butt with a pitchfork, all right? He's not doing that. The hell was created for the devil and his angels, the Bible tells us. Christ is in control of those things. And then he says this to John, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. I believe this is how you interpret Revelation from a futuristic perspective. Write the things which you have seen. What did he see? He just saw Jesus Christ in, in, his, in his present ministry. And then he says the things which are, Revelation 2 and 3 are the things which are, the things that are going on, the seven churches that are in Turkey. And I believe those seven churches give us a history thumbnail sketch of all, of all the churches until the second coming. And then it says, in the things which shall be hereafter. I believe Revelation 4 on are the things that are hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Angels is, is a messenger. They're probably the pastors, okay? And the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. He tells them exactly what he saw. All right, Jesus is at work in our midst. 